Art is fun. I know, I know, it sounds like I'm lying, but hear me out. Telling stories, drawing pictures, carving sculptures, singing songs. People have been making art as long as there have been people. There's something primal and wonderful about creation. The simple act of putting paint to canvas, pinching clay between your fingertips, humming a melody. All these things just feel good to do. Think back to when you were a child. You didn't care if the perspective was right on your drawings, if you were singing in tune, if the story you told made sense, if your Play-Doh actually looked like anything. Just creating was enough. It felt like magic. It's something uniquely human. But the older we get, the less fun it gets. We notice our shortcomings, the notes we can't hit, the words that sound off, the details we get wrong, the countless human mistakes we make. To some degree, this is inevitable. As we get older, our tastes mature. The bar for good increases and our skills don't necessarily grow with it. In response, we specialize. We focus on what we're good at and discard what we're bad at. And that's fine. Not everyone has to be an artist, just like not everyone has to be an athlete. But for many, it goes beyond that. It's not just frustration, it's shame and fear. It's not that your artistic skills aren't good enough, it's that you aren't good enough. Creating art puts too much of your flawed self on display. Mistakes aren't learning experiences, they're proof we shouldn't have tried. Art becomes something to hide away. Only sing in the shower. Only doodle in the margins. Only write in a hidden diary. The instinct to create becomes an unfortunate compulsion, like biting your nails or picking at a scab. It feels good, but I really need to stop. We're traumatized out of perfectly normal forms of self-expression. And that's sad. Not just because of some lost childhood innocence. Making art is good for you. Even if it's not technically proficient, craft helps people process emotions and relieve stress. Just as we've always been making art, we've always been playing games. As outlined in Quentin Smith's 8,000 Years of Board Game History in 43 Minutes, This is a Mancala board, and we find them in some of the earliest human settlements. Across the Middle East, in fact. Now, this is the earliest known kind of board game, but really it's a genre of board games. What Mancala is, is a series of games which have divots in the ground or in a board, perhaps carved from wood, and you can put seeds or shells in the holes and then move them, perhaps picking up four seeds in one hole of your color and moving them, dropping them along the way, kind of like an early version of a uh, backgammon. Now, I want you to dwell on this for a second. The instant that humans became advanced enough that we were able to strip just a tiny bit of free time from each punishing day, we started making games of chance and skill, and as we'll see in a few short thousand years, uh, board games that tell stories. While the history of board games might go all the way back to 6000 BC, the history of play and games in general goes back even further. To quote Super Bunny Hop's Nintendo Labo and Theories of Edutainment, well, in the beginning, for hundreds of thousands of years, we were all hunter-gatherers. And hunter-gatherers have no distinction between work and play, to quote a Boston College psychology professor. A lot of specialized knowledge is still required to grow up as a successful hunter-gatherer, but it was imparted in a much more hands-off way. With kids running off to build play huts and hunt small insects with minimal supervision until the big rite of passage day crossed the line where play had gradually become the real thing. That is, until the agricultural revolution, when education's focus shifted in the interest of literally beating those instincts out of children to teach obedience and work ethic instead. At least today, the instinct to play is much more resilient than the instinct for art. 
It's not uncommon for people to engage in some form of play throughout their entire lives, even if it's something as simple as a crossword or a Sudoku puzzle. Unless you're in an unhealthily competitive space, it's understood that it's okay to be bad at a game and still enjoy it. Today, I want to talk about art games, or rather, games about art. Games that involve creating or performing art as a gameplay mechanic. The most notable examples are rhythm games. There are countless games that involve dancing, singing, playing an instrument, some action synced up to music. Several games allow players to explore basic music composition with simple instruments. But music isn't the only creative space that games explore. There are games about joke writing, games about woodworking, games about embroidery, games about acting, and, most relevant for our purposes, games about drawing. Part of the appeal of games is that they present new experiences in a space without consequences, while not asking for true competency. Someone can gain a better understanding of theme parks by playing Roller Coaster Tycoon or Planet Coaster, but no one is expected to enter or leave with real world theme park experience. Which is good considering- So it starts off with a phenomenal boost, then you get to go through 50 lateral G's, and as soon as you get to the top, you will be dead, and the coaster goes ahead and sends you to hell. Similarly, these art games aren't meant to give people true artistic competency, nor do they expect it. You can argue that someone artistically skilled has an advantage, but interesting scenarios can come from low-skilled art. It's easy to shrug off failures because it's just a game. The expectations are different. Only, it's only a game. Why do you have to be mad? Within this low stakes and low expectations environment, it's possible to rediscover a lost love of art. A similar effect can be seen with adult coloring books. On her blog, Creativity and Therapy, the art therapist Carolyn Melomakalu has a post titled, Is There a Place for Coloring Books in Art Therapy? In it, she says that coloring books function as a safe form of art and a bridge to other forms of art making. The structure and safety of a coloring book may be a more accessible way for some people to begin to connect with their inner creativity, rather than jumping straight into original art making, which can often feel intimidating and anxiety provoking for people who don't consider themselves to be artistic. I have often heard patients mention that they began coloring for relaxation and then decided to start exploring other types of art, both in therapy and for self-care. There are two games I want to focus on today, Art School and Passepartout, The Starving Artist. Both games are not just about creating art, but about being artists. In art school, you play as Froshman, a wide-eyed freshman newly enrolled in the titular art school. You explore the campus, complete assignments, and watch Froshman grow, both as a person and as an artist, throughout the semesters. In Passepartout, the starving artist, you play as the titular Passepartout, a starving artist. With nothing more than a dingy back alley studio and a couple of folding tables to hawk your wares, you begin your artistic career. You create paintings, haggle with customers, and build a name for yourself. Both games are essentially paint programs with a game built around them. You draw pictures, are scored on your output, and are rewarded with more drawing tools as you proceed. As drawing programs, both of them are incredibly simple, even more so than MS Paint. In Passepartout, you only have three brushes. In art school, you only have six colors, but that's to each game's benefit. The limited tools discourage perfectionism. 
You can't create complex masterpieces, so the skill ceiling is lowered. It gives players permission to be less self-critical. You don't have to be good enough because you can't be good enough. All you need to do is draw. It makes drawing feel less intimidating and more playful. I'm someone who gave up on visual art, and yet these games kept me doodling for hours. Those hours went by quickly, each game has a brisk pace. Both expect the player to complete dozens of paintings, either serving an endless stream of customers or completing an education's worth of coursework. Because these games effectively discourage perfectionism, it's easy to jump from painting to painting. If one thing doesn't work, try another. But the drive to constantly produce and produce and produce eventually wears on you. I don't think that this is a game design flaw. It feels meaningful. I claim that these games let people rediscover the magic of art. I still stand by that. But these games also let us understand how we lost that magic in the first place. They place us in the shoes of passionate artists and make us experience that passion getting swallowed by the surrounding world. Deep down, these games are tragedies. Before I talk about art school, I want to talk about the concept of the factory model school, also known as the Prussian model of schooling. Invented in the late 1700s, early 1800s, it describes the standardized, compulsory, age-based schooling we still use today. As described by Khan Academy's Salman Khan, You can imagine an assembly line, you know, and, and there's kind of a, a bucket that is leaving along the assembly yep. line and all of the, you know, kids who were born between August of, you know, they're, they're going to turn five by August are going right. to get thrown into that bucket. And then that bucket is going to move forward at a set pace. And this was all the kids who were turning six by August. And these were all the kids yep. that were seven. And then as they move at the set pace, you kind of have at any given point in the assembly line, you have kind of information being delivered at every point. And... It's fixed how much time the students have, and what's variable is how well they get them. So some of these students are going to get the information, some of it is just, just going to go past them, and they keep getting pushed forward. And at some point, you start looking at the product, and you start saying, oh, that's going to be the good product. You know, if you go to the, if the produce analogy, that orange is really good, it's going to get sold at Whole Foods, that one's going to get squeezed for orange juice. And this, is, it, this is tracking. This is tracking, and right. this, is what, this is what happens. And they call know. this the Prussian model. This is the Prussian model, and it's... It's literally an industrial revolution inspired model. Uh, and it's about as inflexible as a Prussian might be. Today, the phrase factory school has obvious negative connotations. At best, it's described as an outdated system, a clumsy but well-meaning attempt at spreading public education quickly and efficiently. But it was also the first time that people said, no, we want everyone to get an education. For free. For free. Right. Before this, education was just like, well, that's just for people who are going to have white, you wouldn't call it white collar jobs, people who are affluent. Everyone else doesn't even need a, a deep education. The person said, no, we, we are serious about this. And, and the only way to economically do it for free was this industrial type of, sure. of model. Which, which fit the time as well. I mean. At worst, it's viewed as indoctrination. Schools built like factories to turn children into docile factory workers. Clock in, clock out, follow your shifts by the bell. Now, schools have been used as a form of social control before. Abusive Indian boarding schools literally beat English into Native American children. But the idea that the Prussian system was deliberately crafted to resemble factories is a historical myth. Not this time. It never happened. As outlined in Audrey Waters' The Invented History of the Factory Model of Education, Prussia was not highly industrialized when Frederick the Great formalized its education system in the late 1700s. Very few places were back then. Training future factory workers, docile or not, was not really the point. In fact, the Prussian model superseded an education system that actually did look like a factory. The monitorial system and its variants, the Lancaster, the Bell, and the Madras systems, 
involved schools that were housed in large warehouses, larger often than many of the nascent factories at the time, with hundreds of students in one massive classroom with one teacher. Students were grouped, 30 or so together, not by age, but by reading proficiency, with more advanced students, monitors, assigned a tutor and trained the others. The story of the deliberately made factory model is anachronistic. Selman Khan and others state that schools resemble an assembly line, but the Prussian model was formed and standardized in the 1800s. The assembly line and its standardized shift structure wasn't patented until 1901. But it's an enduring myth, and for good reason. Despite being incorrect, it's not wrong. Even if it's unintentional, school can often still feel like a factory. Your individual interests and desires are repressed. You're carted from room to room, completing standardized tasks at a standardized pace. It's easy to swallow the idea that school is a conspiracy to make docile workers, because we're constantly told that school is a means to work. People are trying to f work out how do we educate our children to take their place in the economies of the 21st century? How do we do that? Given that we can't anticipate what the economy will look like at the end of next week. Is a graduating senior in, say, St. Louis as prepared to get a job as the graduate in Shanghai? That's making it too hard to know if our kids are really doing well enough overall, and if they can really compete for a job someday. Even criticisms of the factory model of education still carry work-centric messaging. Industrialization is often touted as both the model and the rationale for public education systems past and present. And, by extension, it's part of a narrative that now contends that schools are no longer equipped to address the needs of a post-industrial world. Headlines like, a factory model for schools no longer works, and beyond the factory model, carry the same implication. The factory model once worked, but factories are no longer the center of the economy, so they no longer work. It's not, conditioning people for work over personal growth is wrong, it's, we're conditioning them for the wrong work. But an employment-first educational mindset clashes with fields where employment is not easily guaranteed, such as art school. Art School is a joke. The video game titled Art School is also a joke. Ideally, an art school doesn't just teach you how to be good at art, it also teaches you how to succeed as an artist. It places you in a network of professional peers and mentors. Not only do you improve your art, but you learn how to network and promote it. To quote Cameron Kunzelman's article, Art School is a game about following your passion in an exploitative world. What does it mean to be schooled in art? What does it mean to receive an arts education? What are you getting there that you can't get anywhere else? The promise of the art school experience is that you will pass through an intense process through which you will emerge as a professional who has some kind of ability to enter the job market in a more expanded capacity. And, you know, that's the promise of all higher education at this point. The things that you will get here, whether those things are skills or simply the name of a certain school on the top of your diploma, will help you out there. But everywhere, especially in the art world, success is fickle. It's hard to predict what will work. The school administrators in the game Art School, faced with this inherent uncertainty, did what everyone else does now. They threw an algorithm at it. Your teacher, Professor Quirtz, is a neural network trained on over 100,000 teraflops of the greatest art in the world. In his own words, his job is to analyze your work against his vast database and give you constructive feedback. 
I was made by scientists, so I'm really good at this. It's an attempt to algorithmically and objectively quantify what is and isn't good art, made by people without a background in art. I sure wonder what that's like. And, as expected, it doesn't work. Professor Quartz has two gameplay functions. To give you drawing prompts, and to judge your creations. His drawing prompts are all over the place. Some are genuinely useful exercises, such as asking for a self-portrait or a drawing of a building. Some are too abstract to be useful, such as scream out loud, draw the scream. <coughs> and some are actively taking the piss. Despite his job description, Quartz has little by way of actual constructive criticism. How did I use color poorly? Was I too restrained? Was I too vibrant? Did I not use proper contrast? The only response he can give is, make the color bar bigger. While I haven't dug into the code, it's possible that these judgments are random. Sometimes the line between an F and an A is just adding extra things to the canvas. I'm not sure, but I've seen others guess the same thing. I don't know anything about this game other than it's weird and cool. So I don't know if these <laughs> ah, yes. weird and cool. are real stats. I don't know if it like actually has an algorithm for figuring out points. But it turns out those grades are, as near as I can tell, randomly generated. You can pour your heart and soul into a painting and get an F, or you can scribble a few lines into the easel and get an A. It does feel like you progress as an artist, gaining new tools and techniques over time, but it's only on your own terms. You're not given new skills because you're taught them, you go out and find them yourself. Taken at face value, it's not a very accurate satire. I mean, to my knowledge, there's no schools grading by faulty algorithm, right? Oh. But rather, it's about how grading systems warp our judgment. Simply put, the art school of art school is going off the wrong model. They're trying to apply standardized objective criteria in a non-standardized, non-objective field. It's not designed to nurture artists, it's designed to create content farms. Players will start drawing for grades, but they'll inevitably get frustrated. Their efforts seem to have little effect on their reward. They either stop caring about grades, drawing for their own sake, trudge through school frustrated, or quit. Any subject, not just art, can become alienating if taught wrong, or taught for the wrong reasons. Education isn't the only place where people can grow alienated from art. Often it can be from our peers. We show art to others and get a mocking reaction. We see people react poorly to someone else's art and are afraid of becoming the next target. We see someone else's more complex art and feel too ashamed to compare. This isn't to say that I'm against art criticism. This channel wouldn't exist otherwise. I also think there's a place for playful mocking criticism. I mean, I've laughed at The Room and Neil Breen films. Who am I? What am I? There are a lot of factors for what feels right to laugh at. I can't really give a conclusive answer on when it's okay to do so. I just try to be careful. At least for me, a mostly consistent factor is money. Movies with multi-million dollar budgets but horrible visuals and nonsensical story. AAA games that ask too much money for too little subpar content. Terrible books propped up with massive advertising campaigns, coasting off a trend or a name. Somewhere along the line, someone is getting scammed. It feels good to mock a scam. The problem comes when people apply this frame of reference to all art. Everything is treated like a consumer product. 
placed on a cost-benefit analysis, put in direct competition with similar works, removed from any context other than, is this worth your money? Anything that doesn't meet your personal tastes becomes a scam. Let's take a look at Patricia Taxon's video, The Kunst Saga, How the Right Wing Views Modern Art. For context's sake, she's using right-wing commentator and soy enthusiast Paul Joseph Watson as a representative of common modern art critiques. So, what does Paul like? Well, he, he, he really likes capitalism. He loves it, in fact. Here's the truth about capitalism. It's the single greatest force in history to alleviate suffering, bring billions of people out of poverty, and create healthier, more prosperous societies and higher living standards for all. But by extension, he also loves what capitalism represents, that beautiful idea that everything you've ever gained was earned by your own two hands, a true meritocracy. This is, of course, bullshit, but let's get into Paul's headspace for a bit. Modern art fucking breaks capitalism. Like, the entire concept of it goes against the very idea of capital. Like, these four crates on the wall have very little value in an objective sense, but then someone bids a million dollars for it. Where, where did the capital come from? Was it magic? But Paul doesn't believe in magic, so he rationalizes. Art must have value because of the labor that went into its creation. If the worth of art is generated from the actual work that took place rather than the art itself, the meritocracy can be maintained. This isn't about the art. The source of the anger comes from someone getting money they didn't deserve. This isn't a new reaction, unique to modern abstract art. Jacob Geller's Who's Afraid of Modern Art, Vandalism, Video Games, and Fascism places it into a historical context with Nazi art galleries. There is little subtlety when looking at the most valued art of the Third Reich. More interesting is the fact that, as well as the galleries full of naked boys with swords, the Nazis also showed off the stuff they hated in a gallery called Degenerate Art. This kind of art, the Nazis said, would only be made by insane and degenerate artists. Specifically, they said they must be mentally ill to create these kind of abstractions. Alongside each piece in this exhibit was the extravagant price they were bought for, inviting mockery and anger. There's a common thread running through this kind of criticism. It doesn't even attempt to engage with the meaning of each painting. Any explanation or interpretation is an excuse, made by a scammer or a sucker. When the main criteria is, how much will someone pay for this art, the artist disappears. Past Part 2, The Starving Artist, is about this disappearance. In Past Part 2, The Starving Artist, the starving part of the title is not an idle threat. You sell paintings to stay ahead of your rent and expenses. If you can't keep up, you're left destitute on the street. Unlike art school, Passpart 2 has an internally consistent judging criteria for your paintings. People have figured out some of what the game's looking for. But the game is not trying to judge you on an objective standard of good or bad. Instead, it's matching paintings to different customers' tastes. You start the game drawing whatever, exploring the system. But as you go on, you notice that certain customers prefer certain things. Some prefer abstract paintings, while others prefer concrete ones. Some prefer cluttered paintings, others enjoy minimalist ones. Some prefer detailed paintings, some like simple ones. Because you don't want to starve, you start specializing, focusing on a single type of customer for consistent sales. Once you make a name for yourself, you move to a new studio and attract higher paying customers. This career advancement is a double-edged sword. Yes, your customers pay more, but your rent increases with it. You have to make better sales more frequently, so you dive even deeper into your niche. But the game keeps track of previous paintings, and penalizes you for making similar ones. To make matters worse, the game's definition of a copy is much wider than yours. You can make a painting that feels original, but the characters will start accusing you of losing your spark or plagiarizing. 
It also judges factors like time spent at the canvas to discourage rapidly making junk. Have a consistent style. Oh, but not too consistent. Make paintings quickly. Oh, but not that quickly. The walls close in as it feels like artistic freedom goes out the window. A painting that doesn't sell is time and rent wasted. You're internally screaming, is this what you want? Is this what you want? With every brushstroke, while staring at a wall of unsold paintings, repeatedly disparaged by passerbys. At a certain point, you can't even sell freely. You advance your career by earning the respect of certain demographics, such as the avant-garde expressionists or the investment-minded businessmen. The game directly tells you to turn away customers that won't advance your brand. You can't stand still, not with homelessness at your heels. And you can't settle, you'll eventually be noticed by a critic or patron. Your only choice is to keep painting and keep selling, even after you've stopped caring what you're painting, even after you've forgotten why you're doing this. Both Art School and Passepartout are stories about artists being warped by external reward. For Froshman, it was grades, and for Passepartout, it's money. But Art School presents its external rewards as a choice, something you can turn away from and still be fulfilled. But in Passepartout, you're forced to chase success. If you don't, you starve. You're trained to view good and successful as the same thing. Even if we don't make a living with art, we still often do the same thing, conflating successful and good. We compare our creations to others made for completely different reasons and completely different circumstances. We make the same who would pay for this evaluation for something we don't plan to sell. We give up artistic agency. The bar was set by someone else and, eventually, will fall short. I normally prefer talking about narrative-heavy games, but these two games are impressive because they're narratively light. Instead, they convey most of their meaning through game mechanics. Given that, I don't think that spoilers are an issue. You can know how each game ends and not lose any enjoyment. But I'm still compelled to give a spoiler warning. I'll be discussing both games' endings from here on out. Both games are pretty short, they can each be beaten in a few hours. If you want to stop the video and try either game, feel free to do so. I'll be waiting with open arms. Passepartout and Froshman have very different career paths. To put it simply, one artist is successful, and the other is not. But they both share the same comic bitterness. Passepartout has four different endings. Each one is achieved by focusing on a single type of customer in the endgame. Despite the very different routes you take to get there, each ending is functionally the same. Passepartout wants to be a famous artist and he achieves his dream. It jumps ahead 50 years, and you're shown a packed museum filled with your art, while a text overlay explains your effect on the art world. Whether you're an avant-garde artist, challenging everyone's preconceptions, or you're a sellout, painting only for money, the result is the same. You pandered to the right audience. True authenticity is impossible. Everything is brand, marketing, and sales. The only difference is how open you are about it. Art School has only one ending, but it's more in depth. In between semesters, you see Froshman's conviction waver. Despite their enthusiasm, they find their workload intimidating. They start to doubt whether they should even be an artist. But they never doubt the institution they're in. The instructor knows what he's doing, the lessons make sense. 
It must be their fault for struggling, right? Despite their struggles, they manage to graduate, but Froshman's doubts still linger. During graduation, they ask the professor about their future. The screen fades to black and you return to the main menu. It's an ambiguous ending. The limits of the professor's programming is put on display. When faced with doubt, he only has vague platitudes. When pressed, he only repeats. Still, despite the school's flaws, Froshman grew. They have a portfolio to show for their efforts. It's up to the viewer to interpret whether they're ready for the outside world. And then you hit the continue button. You're spawned in a flat, empty town. Compared to the dreamlike campus, this place is dull. There's an airport, a playground, a power plant, a cemetery, and plenty of other structures, but there's nothing to do here. The only interesting landmark is a massive hole in the center of town, large enough that you can't see where it goes. Once you finish your pointless search, all that's left to do is jump. Surprisingly, you land back in the campus. The lack of music makes an already empty place seem emptier. Still, you're an alumnus. You might as well visit your old professor. You enter the nearest building and... You respawn in town. You've been rejected. You can revisit the campus all you want, but it's not for you anymore. You graduated. Higher education failed Froshman. You can't even go back as a teacher. After all, that position was automated. Both games are profoundly lonely experiences. Like I mentioned before, one of the advantages of art schools is that they allow you to network with other artists. But Froshman's campus is empty. It's a nonsensical space, but there are signs that more people should be here. There's an outdoor theater, a park with picnic blankets laid out, a giant chess set, multiple buildings, but no one's here. There's just you and an AI, one that also might be lonely. Things don't get better as you graduate. At least on campus, you had your professor to interact with, and helpful as he was. Here, the only sign of life is a single blank human figure, T-posing in the middle of the road, with no way to interact. It's like the game is mocking you for expecting companionship. Past Part 2 has more people, but there's only one type of relationship. The relationship between producer and consumer. The customers come in different types, but each one is full of palette swaps. To you, they're all interchangeable. Just another wallet with a face. The endings all feature groups of people admiring your work, but in all of them, someone is missing. You. At best, you just get a statue or a bust there in your stead. The ending text describes you in past tense. You might be dead. You're forever cut off from both your audience and from other artists. Both games leave you atomized, cut off from any wider community. Your only feedback comes from impersonal and flawed systems of judgment. Art is a form of communication, 
but you have no one to meaningfully communicate with. You're talking to yourself. It's no surprise that people feel alienated from art. It's just another facet of being alienated from the world in general. But maybe there's another way. Next video, we'll be looking at two more games about art. Ones that take a very different approach. I hope to see you there. So, how did you like the video? Any criticisms or additions? Interested in either game? Do you know of any other art making games I should check out? Tell us in the comments below. Now that I've guilted you with stories of artist alienation, you should like and subscribe to make me feel better. This is Else If Games, signing off.